What is up guys, welcome back to the Underground Running Project. This is episode number eight. Here we have a very special guest on this episode, the first interview that we're conducting of the Underground Running Project. Uh, this is David Suarez, your host. And your co-host, Danny Areses. We have a very special guest, Ryan Raposo. Hey everybody, how you doing? This is gonna be our first interview that we actually have on the podcast. Uh, so a big step forward for us. Uh, we also have another special guest here that's taking videos for us, uh, Austin Dunand. Uh, he's a friend of Danny, so he's going to be out here taking pictures, taking videos for us. Uh, so you'll see some more posts on the Instagram page a little bit this week. Uh, if you guys need the Instagram page, it is at Underground Running Project. is uh, the new Instagram that we created. Um, if you need our personal Instagrams, mine is at David Suarez XCs. And mine's Danny dot ISS. Uh, Raposo, how can people get into contact with you? Ryan Raposo at Gmail. No, <laughs> uh, at Ryan Raposo for, uh, for Instagram. And then I also run uh, at Gulliver Runners. So, let's get a little bit started with this podcast. Uh, the first question I have for you is, when did you make the decision in your life that you wanted to become a coach as a career path? Oh, that's tough. Um, well, this is going to tie into my background a little bit, but uh, when I first started doing track, I was in high school, and I wasn't a very good athlete, but uh, I really enjoyed the sport, and I had coaches that were pretty motivational, and so it was one of those where after I graduated, I was like, I want to go back, and I want to see my own teammates and hang out with my own coaches. And so um, I graduated from Braddock, and when uh, I graduated, I went to FIU, and then I came back that, that next track to just kind of like help out and hang out. Um, and then uh, we had a couple of new coaches that come on staff, and they were kind of like, hey, you're going to come around and help out with cross country? And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? So kind of came out and then started acting a little bit more like a volunteer coach. Mm -hmm. uh, they started teaching me the ropes and stuff like that. And after doing that for like a year, then they're like, hey, man, you know, you should come on as an, uh, an official assistant. And so the year after that, they brought me on as an official assistant, and it got to the point where like I really started liking it. Um, yeah, after that, Ferguson opened up, the, uh, the principal, the AD, the head coach for the boys and the head coach for the girls, they all went on over, uh, the girls track team, um, because the head girl was cross coaching with the Coral Reef. Um, but they all went over to Ferguson, they were kind of like, hey man, we're gonna have a spot for you, you know, this upcoming year, you know, because we don't have any assistant positions the first year, so I kind of went on over there, and I was still finishing up school at FIU, and I was doing assistant coaching, and I was like, all right man, let's see how I can like, put this all together and make it work for me, and so the good thing was, uh, at Ferguson, since every year they were they were adding new classes, like you know freshman class, sophomore, junior year. By the time I came to the senior year, I was graduating from FIU. Uh, I had my degree in psychology. Ferguson was adding new teachers every year. The guy that was the head coach, my assistant, coached under for four years, Julio Valdez, was a total badass as far as I'm concerned. Um, he was leaving, and so it basically worked out perfectly. That took his social studies position and his head coaching position, and so. Um, I mean, I probably knew somewhere in those assistant coaching years because that's kind of what I wanted to do. I can't say specifically when, but it was one of those where I just, you know, that the team was pretty good. You know, I really enjoyed the atmosphere and the, the rapport that I gained with all the athletes, and it was just one of those where I, I loved it. And so I just kind of stuck with it and been doing it ever since. And beforehand to you deciding on being a teacher and stuff, what was your actual career plan? Like, what did you actually plan to do with your life before you thought coaching was going to be the thing? Oh man, um, I would say in high school it was probably going to be architecture. Um, I had done drafting. I actually was a, a gold seal vocational recipient because I had done three years of drafting and aced all those courses. And so I got the Florida Bright Futures Gold Seal. Um, and so when I came to FIU, they really didn't have such a strong architecture program. It was sort of like on the come up. Um, but I really, you know, kind of was getting into like my core classes and stuff. And then when I started going towards like trying to pick my major, um, I ended up. Uh, well, it's a long story, but I mean, I ended up getting kicked out of my parents' house. You know, it was one of those where, you know, you were one of those, you know, those teenagers, and you know, you and your parents, you know, don't get along. Whatever. I was working full time, uh, you know, coaching part time and stuff. Uh, so I kind of went to like a semester where like, I didn't really take any classes, like computer class, you know, whatever. So when I started coming back you know, into school full time, uh, I really, really wasn't in like the architecture mode. It was like I was still kind of coaching, and so I was kind of like, all right, let's see kind of what classes I'm taking that I like. And so I ended up kind of going the psychology route. Um, and I ended up getting my degree in psychology, so um, probably that, that sort of lull in the middle there kind of maybe took me away from any kind of aspirations or anything thought that I had before. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's kind of what ended up maybe making me go more towards the coaching side was that that's what I was still doing, kind of going through that lull where I was working full time in sports authority, and which has, you know, obviously some kind of sport and athletic tie yeah. in. I was working in the footwear department, you know, which ties into running. Um, but yeah, so, you know, anything that was architecture related kind of fell away, uh, and I went straight towards the coaching side. Mm -hmm. So, for me, like on a coaching perspective, since I've just started coaching, it's my second year now. Just a quick question, half you is: Did you ever have any doubts over like the time before you're starting coaching, like financially? Would you ever be able to like support yourself and things like that? Did you ever have thoughts of that? Um, well, the thing with coaching, at least at the high school level, is that that's not what brings into money. It's teaching, you know. Um, and so the reality is that you know you'll quickly you know learn very on in your career that. 
coaching is teaching. You know, if you're a good teacher, you can be a good coach. You know, just a different subject material, obviously. Um, so for me, they were kind of one and the same. It's just what I was teaching in the classroom was psychology um, versus what I was teaching out, you know, on the track, you know, was track or cross country or distance running or whatever it might be, or portals or pole vault or jumps, or <laughs> a little bit of everything. Um, so it's one of those where I, I never really thought I was gonna be maybe a full-time coach and that's all I do. Um, and I never really thought about it from the money side of things. I was just kind of doing what I loved and just kept kind of going with it. Now I'm in a position where I'm not really working full-time, I'm just doing a whole bunch of different coaching gigs. Um, so it's a little bit different, but uh, it's a good thing I saved up some money for a few years there. Uh, and so, you know, I'm kind of living a little bit off of savings and kind of living off of my, my paychecks and, you know, maybe one day I'll end up at a big time college. question is going to be, um, during your career, was there a point as a coach where you thought, I won't be able to live off just becoming a, being a coach? And did you think about like, oh, I'm going to have to take another career path, so I'm going to have to go another way? Um, I mean, this past year, uh, like I said, I, you know, I, I, I stopped working full time. I'm actually going back to get uh, my master's. I'll be done in two weeks. Um, and so while I've been working on my master's, um, it's one of those where obviously now I need to start looking towards what's my full time job going to be? Where, where am I going to be making the money? Um, and so it's basically one of two options. You can try to find a full time job and continue to, in coaching on the side like I was when I was teaching, or it's really like go head first into the coaching gig. I mean, really try to find either a, a small college that I can, you know, kind of work my way into now that I've done, you know, a year of assistant coaching at the collegiate level. I have a little bit of experience I can try. So like, for example, Kaiser University just fired up their entire coaching staff. So that's a, you know, a place I could, I, I would have a feeling that I could have a, an interview and probably do fairly well based off of my resume. Um, or, you know, it's one of those where I could go down the private route, you know, maybe do personal training and coaching on that side. And, and you know, it's one of those where if you really love it and you truly have a passion for it, could you make a living out of it? Yes, but you got, you got to be gung-ho for it. I mean, you really have to, you know, do your work at a website, pull in clients, you know, you know uh, make sure that you have the proper, you know, education and the certifications to be able to work with, with personnel um, if you want to try to make that a full-time job to make that your career if you're not working at a, a full-time institution. Mm -hmm. So, like, your, your angle or, like, I guess you could say, like, your dream goal kind of is coaching, like, at a big-time college? Um, I guess. Um, I've always been big on progressions. I know a lot of people have no problem kind of just like jumping into places. For me, it was like I did the, I'm an alumni, then I did the volunteer coach, I did the assistant coach, I did the head coach, but the co-head coaching, and then I did like the program director, you know, as I worked from Braddock through Ferguson. Um, and then in the last year, I've done college assistant coaching. And then, so it's like, I feel like I've kind of gone like the proper route. Like I've had a little bit of time at every single level. So I feel like the next step would be like, a college assistant coach where it's like head cross but assistant track coach and then from there maybe like overall program director head coach so i feel like that's a natural progression i wouldn't feel comfortable kind of just saying all right let me go and be the head coach at some big time d1 college when i don't really have the experience to get there whereas i know other people don't necessarily feel that way you know they could be like oh i was a big time you know d1 runner so now let me go coach it's not quite the same there's so much from the administrative side and the paperwork side that you know they need to learn and i'm not going to go and do something that i'm not completely confident in because I want to make sure that I know what I'm doing and that I can be confident in it and I can do things the right way and continue to progress within my profession. So like how you're saying like Kaiser, like let's say that you said you just, you know, right. covered the whole stuff, like is that like a step you would take towards doing this or you're trying to go to like a bigger school like you're saying and like become the assistant of track and cross? Um, I'm working at, at St. Thomas University, which is a small NAIA school and so I feel like that's sort of where I need to be for right now. Um, I mean, I have no problem going to like a bigger school. So Kaiser's in our, in our same conference, the NAIA. Uh, Florida Memorial is another local college that's in that same thing. Um, and so I feel like that's sort of a where, I, where I should be right now, uh, just based off of my experience. I've, again, I've only done assistant coaching at the collegiate level for a year. After this next year, if I feel like, hey, I've, I've done everything that I need to, or I, you know, I understand it and I have a handle on it, then maybe that is the next step. Maybe to try to go and look for a position like that. Or maybe, you know, St. Thomas kind of, you know, we're a second year track program now, um, so we're kind of like rebuilding the athletic program. So if it comes to that where St. Thomas now starts offering more full-time positions, maybe that's a position that I can work into. Maybe our, our current coach, Coach Mamie, ends up becoming like overall program director, and then I become like the number two. You know, that'd be kind of cool. Um, although he coaches cross country, so that, that probably wouldn't work, but you know, I can be you know, a co-head coach or something like that. And like you were saying before about, uh, since you want to build up and make sure that you're ready for take on a big job, like let's say, a, a, huge division one school right. uh, head coach job. Do you see that often nowadays that people dive into jobs with their 
necessarily not ready for or they're not qualified for? Like, do you think that's a problem that's currently like, ongoing? I can look at many coaches within this county that I think kind of jumped into head coaching positions where they were not assistants, and I see that they don't have the proper foundation to be able to do what it is that they want to do. Like, they want to be good, but they don't quite know how to get there, at least based on my opinion. Um, I mean, simple things like when I first started coaching, I wanted to be known by people in the county. It was like, who do I got to, to, to meet that's been around and knows what they're doing so that I can learn from them? You know, in fact, I want to shadow all the good coaches that have been around. You know, and um, part of that was just being there um, because obviously if you're there, people see you and they can start, you know, figuring out, hey, you know, here's, here's this young guy that, that cares, you know, that wants to, to be good. Um, but only uh, after a couple of years, people start acknowledging me because the turnover is so high, right? You see coaches, they come on in and they end up leaving within a year or two. So it wasn't like three, four, or five years. We're like, hey, yeah, we know who you are. But then at the same time, it was like, all right, let me start getting my foot into a different door, right? So I started hosting meets, start hosting competitions, and people start, you know, learning who you are because they have to contact you. Oh, what's the registration information? How, you know, how much does it cost to get into the meet? So you start learning things from the administrative side. So for me, it's always like I'm always trying to progress in my career, try to do something a little bit, a little step further. Um, I've done stuff with our, our coaching association, uh, the Florida Athletic Coaches Association, uh, with like the state rankings. So I've done that for a number of years, uh, an administrator on Florida runners, you know, so people you know, need help here and there. So I mean, my kind of hand is a little bit everywhere. Um, so in this county, I've helped host the GMAC, I'm on the Youth Fair uh, Committee, I'm on the Junior Orange Bowl Committee, so I help host those events for the middle school and the high schools. Oh, middle school meets, track meets. I mean, we started off hosting like one or two middle school meets, and by, you know, five, six years into it, we ended up hosting like almost all the public school middle school meets at Ferguson every year. You know, so little things like that where you're really trying to, to gain experience, you know, push yourself, learn as much as possible, you know, heck, push, push your brand, right? You know, it's uh, yeah. one of those where you're trying to show like, look, I care about the sport, I care about the kids, I want to do you know, everything that I can for the kids, you know, learn as much as I can. Um, that's what it is for me, you know, so I feel like, you know, no, it doesn't matter what I'm doing, I want to try to get to that next step, and then when I feel like I've accomplished it, all right, what's the step after that, mm -hmm. you know? The next question is, uh, like, like you were saying now, you wanted to learn as much as you could from other coaches and from all the top coaches that you could. Right. Uh, when you were going through your ranks, like trying to make it through the ranks of becoming as big as you are now, right. uh, who were your mentors and what did they teach you that you didn't previously know before? Um, when I first started coaching, um, or actually, when I first started running, um, my head track coaches were Andrea Adderley was our girls coach and Robert Zemmel was our boys coach. And they were very good motivators and they were the ones that kind of gave me like, a love for the sport. Um, and then when I came back and started helping out, Simon had left, and then Julio Valdez and Bill Wilson came on in. And these were two guys that were like legit runners, collegiate runners. Uh, Valdez ran professionally for Nike for a little bit. Um, these guys were studs. And these guys were the guys that like, kind of really put the passion into me um, because these guys knew the sport. They, they grew the sport. Like when I was at Braddock, if we had like five kids on the line, I was like, hey, we can score today. You know, within like two years, we got a team of like 30 guys and 30 girls. I was like, oh man, this is awesome. Like I'm giving these guys props. Like they know what they're doing, but I didn't know anything because. You know, I was such a bad runner. So, I mean, it's funny because, like, my high school career was, like, trying to break 60 seconds at a 400. Like, that's what I thought track was, mm -hmm. you know? Because I'm a you know, skinny white guy, got no business running, you know, sprints. But, you know, I didn't know any, any better. Um, and so, for me, I've always felt like running is, like, this exclusive club. Like, whenever I talk to, like, some of these great coaches around the state, I started realizing, like, oh, they ran for, like, this great coach. Or, like, you know, they, they were a great collegiate athlete and stuff. And people always have to, like, oh, so who'd you run for? I'm like... <laughs> I <laughs> run for anybody. They're like, oh, how, you know, how do you know? You know that? And so um, for me, it was like, you know, Valdez and Wilson were sort of like uh, the two that kind of set the foundation for me. Um, our athletic director, Bob Zell, uh, who was at Braddock, and then, well, he was my athletic director when I was in school, and then uh, I kind of ended up working for him uh, at, at Ferguson. Uh, he was a track and cross country guy. Uh, so he's another guy that sort of you know, helped mentor me and try to get me into that whole, the mindset of not just being a coach, but being like a program director, you know, going through the progressions learning as much as possible. You know, so I started going to our state clinics, the FACA clinics from that. Um, he also hired Victor Kensler, who came on over from Varela, and he's the one that really showed me the administrative side and how to host uh, events and competitions. So in my early years, definitely those are gonna be the guys that really, you know, put down the foundation for me. Um, but then once I started going to like coaching clinics and stuff, man, I mean, the list, the list gets really, really long. Um, I just went to a running camp earlier in the week, and uh, there was a warrior running camp up at Weber International. I saw, I saw uh, like a, a little picture of you, like standing up like a blackboard, just like this right. little fast. Yeah. Um, and so one of the guys that, that was there, uh, I mean the guy that, um, and there's a few guys that put it on, but um, Coach Jim Simpson at Weber International. I've known him for a number of years over in Northport. Really nice guy, and he's the one that invited me to come on up. But one of the counselors there is Coach Mike Hill. When I first started coaching, Mike Hill was like the guy. Like that was the program. He coached at Winter Park. They were like state runner-up in 2000. They won state champs in 01, 02, 03, 04. Okay, 
had a whole bunch of like a, you know calamity of errors in 05, didn't even make it to state, come back in 06 and win it again. I mean, this guy was a, this guy was a stud. And so my first clinic I ever go to, you know, I was just some young punk kid that goes on the Florida Runners and you know talks smack on the discussion board. And um, so he came on out uh, and he you know introduced himself to me along with this other guy Mike Boza who was winning a bunch of state championships over at Tampa Jesuit. And these guys were like super super nice to me, like super inviting. And so uh, they kind of were the first ones to kind of introduce me to all these you know elite level coaches that go to our state clinics every year. And I mean, you end up picking up a ton of stuff from all these great coaches. A lot of them I've become pretty good uh, friends with. Um, so uh, Kristen McWilliams uh, is one that she's at Winter Park now. She's won a whole bunch of freaking championships, and she's like an elite level coach. Um, I'm really good friends with her. Um, she's definitely an inspiration. Uh, Rick Rothman was the, um, the FACA cross country director when I first started coming to those clinics, and he hosted those for a number of years. He's a guy that I've looked up to. He hosted the, the Spanish River Invitational. He coached there for, I think, close to 30 years or so, maybe a little bit longer. Um, those are gonna be some of the, the first big names, and I mean, I can go down the list of, I mean, just like total like badass coaches, guys that won more state championships than probably years have been alive. You know, Roy Harrison at Plant, you know, he's awesome. You got uh, Tony Ryan over at Bowles, he's awesome. A lot of the guys in, in Jacksonville are pretty cool. We talk about the Frank brothers are awesome. Paul and Wiki, he called me up yesterday. He's at Barkham Trail. He's a great guy. He's been coaching. That guy tells me all the time. He goes, man, Ryan, he, goes, he called me Boy Wonder. Hey, Boy Wonder, you know what? I got underwear older than you. Paul and Wiki, he's, oh, a, he's a trip. Um, uh, Scott Gowan, who was at Childs, um, he's not coaching currently. Uh, Gary Droz at McClay. Um, I mean, these are guys, like, if you sit down and you look at, like, the history books, which is one thing I've always loved to do, like, literally pull up the FHSA state championship record and start looking across, you start realizing who are the, the coaches that have won, like, multiple state championships. I mean, these are the, the, the guys that really put the programs on the map. Here in Miami, Doc Crabtree and Don Kappelman uh, at Ransom have always been super uh, nice and cool to me. Um, I've had a, a couple of clinics with them over the years. Uh, Victor Arrieta over at Belen, Frank Ruiz at Belen, uh, arguably the best boys coach in the history of Florida. And I'll sit there and debate that with anybody. A lot of people talk about uh, Brent Haley over at uh, Largo, won 10 state championships. I think Frankie has nine right now, so he's, he's knocking on that door. Hmm. Um, I mean, in this county, I've heard a lot of good things about other coaches. Jeff Petro, I've only spoken to via email. He was the old Ransom boys coach. Uh, he coached Billy Conby, uh, who was the best assistant trainer ever come out of Miami. And number two would be Julio Valdez, who I assisted Coach Thunder. Um, you know, Bill's you know, been a guy that's really helped me out a lot over the years. His son Kurt ran for Corby a couple years ago. Um, who am I forgetting? I don't forget. Ari right Montalvo at Lawrence, he won a number of state championships. He was awesome. So kind of when I was coming in, he was sort of going out. So he used to do like the girls' state rankings for Class 4A, and then uh, he asked me to take over for him. Um, Mike Becker, who's at, at Ransom, he did a stint at Corby. Crazy awesome guy. Uh, he's, he's been all over the place. He actually holds like the state record for the least points scored at the state championship when he goes to Palmer Trinity back like in like, the 80s or the late 70s. Like 21 points. Yeah, it's, it's completely crazy. It's, if you ever go look at it, there's a whole article about it on uh, the Paul Runners that he wrote. If you go look at like those guys on the podium, they're literally wearing like white, white beaters and like Mickey Mouse like shorts on the state podium. It's like totally awesome. Um, so I'm, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of other coaches that I'm forgetting, but I mean, these are just the ones that are popping in my head. And again, if you sit down and like look at like the history books and the record books of like the state or in Miami, you start realizing like the consistency, the longevity, the state championships. I mean, these are people that I really aspire, you know, to be like. And so, I mean, I look at myself as like a pretty good coach, and I have like some accomplishments that I know that I've done that you know, like uh, getting you know as many GMAC championships. I mean, I probably have more GMAC championships than probably any other coach in the history of the public schools. I, I, I exclude Columbus because they have like a gazillion. Um, so outside of Columbus, um, but uh, like little things like I made the state podium for the boy for the boys team at Ferguson and the girls team. I don't think any other coach in Miami's ever done that. So that's like one of my small claims to fame. But I mean, I've never won a state championship. And these other people, you know, they got more rings, they got fingers, you know. So um, a lot of coaches I hold in very very high regard, uh, and, and uh, I hope to be like many of them. <laughs> All right, so we all know that now, like you're not at Ferguson anymore, but you're gonna you're at Gulliver and you're also at St. Thomas University. Right. What are your roles there, and like, how do you plan on like building the program? So uh, I've been at St. Thomas University for a year now. Um, when I was brought in, it was sort of like we were kind of starting a, a track program, so we're kind of bringing in a few different coaches and all kind of different ability levels. So we brought in uh, Jose Garcia, who was helping out with like distance and people chase. Uh, Joey Scott came in to help out with like sprints, a little bit of jumps or hurdles. Um, Donald Heaven, you know, was doing throws, uh, and, coach, and all, it's funny because all the coaches also coach high school because NAI programs you can kind of double dip, so Carlos Mamey was our program director, so he's at St. Brendan and uh, at St. Thomas. And so when I was brought in, it was sort of like, he, he refers to me like the Swiss Army Knight because I did so many things at Ferguson, so he first was like, alright, so you're going to be kind of like assistant distance and like middle distance. And then like once the season started rolling around, I was like, okay, so you're going to kind of be like 
working with like the kids coming off of injury and the developmental kids that are coming out of other sports like basketball and soccer because we're a small private school so we can get kids from other sports and you're gonna be working with some of the jumpers and you're gonna be working with you know it was like all of a sudden I have all these different athletes um, so I mean I was working with hurdlers I was working with, you know uh, Bentley was doing pole vault sometimes I was working with you know long jumper triple jumpers high jumpers I was working with like literally kids that had never done track before in their life and had two left feet um, so I kind of had like this weird hodgepodge. I had a bunch of kids that were coming off of a season, like an underperforming season. Maybe they were a little bit overtrained or coming off an injury. So I basically kind of did like a catch-all. Um, he really wanted me to kind of work with multi-athletes um, because again, that kind of makes sense if you have a you know, wide you know, base of knowledge. But uh, our conference doesn't have the HEP or the decathlon. No way. Yeah, so the small NAI you know, division doesn't have it. So. I mean, is that because they don't have enough athletes to do it, or like? Right. So, well, when I went to the conference, we always have a, a coaches meeting right before the conference championship, and so that was like one of the questions, like, "Hey, uh, you know, make sure that uh, we need to talk to these other coaches and be like, hey, uh, why don't we have multis?" And they're kind of like, "Oh, because," uh, and it's like that. They don't have enough athletes to kind of make it competitive. So it's like they compete at the nationals, but we don't have it in the conference. Um, so that that way we can try to make some of those changes. So he really wants to be working with like the decathlete, heptathlete type athletes. Um, but one cool thing is like there's no like event restrictions, so. If, I coach a kid to kind of be like a decathlete and they can kind of do everything. Well, when we get to the conference, I mean, I could throw them in 10, 10 events. Not that I'm going to, but I could, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so uh, that's kind of the role I'm going to be working with this year. Um, at Gulliver, uh, they brought me in this past track season to sort of be like, um, sort of like the number two, like a head coach, but like associate head coach, because I was obviously new to the, the small private school circuit. Um, and so it was originally going to be kind of working with distance and end up kind of working a little bit with everybody. Um, so uh, I kind of helped out with the sprint coaches and one of our sprint coaches wasn't always there. Um, and the other one was brand new to coaching, so I kind of kind of worked in there a little bit. Um, the jumps coach was a girl that used to jump for me, and then she was the Gulliver Middle School coach, and so she was coming up to the high school, so I kind of you know helped her out some you know now and then. Um, and then obviously trying to do stuff with you know relays and hurdles and distance and middle distance, and so again a little bit of everybody at Gulliver because um, our head coach is the throws coach. Um, and so then just I want to say within the last month or two, um, ended up getting the head cross country position. Uh, so the cool thing is that we actually have like a middle school program, and so it's like I'm top to bottom head coach, which is you know something that I've always thought was a big private school advantage. The fact that you could coach kids for like seven years, you know, yeah. whereas I never had that advantage in the, in the public circuit. So, you know, I think it's going to be you know a fun and new adventure trying to work with some of the middle school kids and try to you know see how kids can develop over all these years. But those those are my roles currently, not counting you know administrative work for Florida Runners and helping host meets and uh, doing all the timing stuff with track timing and data management. Larry Wooten, Mariana Carter. That's a, that's a good little crew there, so I help out with all the, the timing and all the different competitions. So I'm kind of all over the place. Still do stuff for the FACA. Um, you know, you know what it is. Like the senior all star meet. You know, if anybody's ever run the senior all star meet in Florida, you know, I'm one of the guys that kind of puts that whole thing together. Uh, the Foot Locker. Yeah, uh, I've done the, the Foot Locker bus a bunch of times with uh, Coach Doug Butler. Oh, how could I leave off Doug Butler on my list of people yeah, yeah, yeah. that have inspired me? <laughs> this guy's got like 20 state championships, so he was at Holy Trinity for a number of years, uh, and now he's over at Satellite. Yeah. Doug, Doug's awesome. Oh, I love that guy. Man, see, I told you I was going to forget somebody. Yeah. i got to start thinking, man. I'm going to start thinking. Yeah, yeah, that's a big name, yeah, dude. This guy, I'm serious. Wow. Man, I'm sorry, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening, I'm sorry. <laughs> so the next question that I have for you is, um, during your time, at, during the public school circuit, so let's say at Ferguson and stuff, um, you had, I'm sure you had other schools that were offering you jobs, like you know, left and right, and people that wanted you to leave public school, maybe people were talking shit, maybe saying, uh, like, Oh, why are you gonna stay at a public school? Like that's so small. Like move on to bigger things. Like let's come coach. I come coach at this college. Or why did you decide to stay at Ferguson and keep building that, and as opposed to leaving it and just going on to the next step? Um, I had a, a couple of offers over the years, um, but I mean, a couple of times it was with actually like, like other public schools, for example, like, hey, come on back to Bragg, your old alma mater. And it's kind of like, what are you going to offer me that I don't already have at Ferguson? Like, I already have my full time position. I'm already teaching the subject of my major in college. Like, I have a track, I have a good team. So, it's like, just because you're my alma mater, eh, it might work for some people, it didn't work for me. Um, I had an offer to go to, funny enough, Northwood University, which then got bought out by Kaiser. Um, so when they were first kind of coming up, uh, Kent Baker, who was the, the program director there, he called me up to call him going over there. But for me, it was like, do I want to go to West Palm Beach to go coach and make less money and to be at a brand new upstart program? Because again, it's a small private school, so they're not going to be paying you. I mean, as a teacher, I'm making you know 44 grand a year plus supplements. I'm getting close to like 50 grand a year. But like over there, you know, it's obviously a pay cut and, and starting from scratch. So it's kind of like. Uh, and at that point, like when I've had like really good teams over all these years, like my guy team was really good the first few years at Ferguson. 
we had a little bit of a fall off, and that's when my girl team got really good. So it was never like a lull. You know, I had a top 10 team at state every single year. So it's not like if, if I had a, a couple of years there where like we were pretty bad, I might have thought about it. But it was never, never one of those where I was like, yeah, it's time for me to go somewhere else. I always felt like I can get to that next step, right? Because I hadn't won that state championship yet, or I hadn't gotten, you know, two two teams, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, in the top ten the same year. You know, whatever it might have been, like there was always like uh, something else to, to catch. There was always another thing to to, to try to aspire to. Um, so I never really felt like I had I'd reached every single little goal that I wanted. But then again, I guess it's kind of my nature, right? Like I'm always going to set new goals, so mm -hmm. it's not like I'm ever going to, you know, achieve anything, right? Like you can always get faster, right? There's always that new PR. Yeah, 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 definitely. So I mean, yeah, I've had other, you know, offers and stuff, but um, I mean, none that were, you know, so tasty. I was like, oh, I got to get out of here. Um, I know Coral Reef um, for a number of years to look for like a, you know, a full-time coach, and uh, I was friends with their old AD, Deb Margolis. And I'm sure if I was like, hey, Deb, you know, I'm, I'm ready to come on over because she was, you know, dealing with so many contract coaches and coaches that kind of turned over and stuff. But um, no, man, I, I had a good setup at Ferguson for a long time. You know, I was there for, for 12 years, if you don't count the, the first year where Ferguson and Bradford kind of housed together. And do you think that that's, uh, your experience overall has given you that advantage over others where you have that kind of like that flexibility where you can, maybe if you really wanted to, you could go and, oh, like, I'm ready to work here. Like, I'll take up on your offer now. And like, you think you have like a lot of offers now that you could, possibly take up on because of your experience? Oh, well, it's, it's funny because everything that I'm doing now, I didn't, there was like no real like interview process. It was sort of like, yeah. uh, I walked into St. Thomas and it was like, hey, AD, this is who we're hiring. Oh, nice to meet you. You know, and then I walked into Gulliver and um, there's a lot of support at Gulliver. Um, as much support as I had at Ferguson when, when Ferguson first opened, that's how Gulliver feels now, um, where I actually have like administration that like, knows and cares. Um, and so when I walk in there and they just, they're like, Oh, you're part of the state coaching association, and oh, you work with the Orange Bowl, and oh, you work with the Youth Fair, and oh, you have you know coaching certifications through USATF. Like they know that I put in the work and that I know what I'm doing, so it's kind of like more of like a formality than anything else. Like we know who you are, we know what you've done, so you know let's kind of bring that success and stuff that you've had over to our program. Let's get Gulliver back to you know where we were, you know, 10, 15 years ago, where we were, you know, one of the top teams in the county, one of the best teams in the state, winning state championships, things like that. So. Um, it's one of those where it's more like, hey, just get the paperwork done, you know, come on in and help us out kind of thing, uh, which I think is awesome. You know, it's like, hey, cool, my, my resume is finally, you know, kind of working for me a little bit. Uh, so um, that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, for my classes at UF, um, I'm doing my, finishing my master's in, in sport management, but uh, I'm doing a specialized track in athlete performance and development. And it's awesome because, like, one of my professors that I had a couple classes with in training high performance athletes, Dr. Christine Brooks, she actually did my United States Track and Field Level 2 sports science certifications. So it's kind of like, hey, I already know one of my professors. You know, so I talked to her, she's like, all oh, right, you've already seen all this stuff. Like, you're going to know like 75% of the curriculum. <laughs> so it's like, oh, this is fantastic. Like, again, man, my experience is helping me out. So, like, my master's classes, I've known almost everything in, in, in most of my classes because of my background through United States Track and Field and all my coaching clinics and things like that. So. Um, I mean, yeah, g gaining as much experience as possible, it helps out um, in multiple ways, whether it's talking to a college professor or talking to you know, a tech director of a different school or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, so as a coach, like, I know some coaches are, like, are secretive of like, their workouts and what they do, and some are all open about it. Like, I'm sure a lot of like, high school coaches, maybe even college coaches, like, want to know like, what you do to make your runners like how they are today. Like, how open are you to like, telling other coaches, like, your workouts and things like that. I'll, I'll tell you everything that we do. I have, I have no problem. And when you go up to like the state clinic, and that's why like, all these names that I've been dropping, all those coaches are, are pretty open. They'll talk to you about the different workouts you're doing, so they will exchange workouts and stuff like that. Um, so I know like uh, Christy McWilliams, you know, I've talked to her about some of the different workouts that she's done, and she's like taking workouts from me, like, oh, like what's a good 800 meter workout? And I'll give her a workout, and, you know, she'll, you know, flip one out with me. Um, uh, Angie Bannenfeld, or now Angie Flaytes, um, you know, I've talked to her a bunch over the years, so she and I are very, very tight. She's another coach, when she was at Dr. Phillips, I mean, they were at a different level. She came down here to, to Killian in Columbus for a while. She's another awesome uh, coach, a friend of mine. Uh, George Flaytes is one of my big rivals, you know, but, you know, we sit there and we have no problem talking about different kinds of workouts or knowing what different athletes are going to do. Um, I always viewed it as that coaching is like being a chef, and I've said this for, for a while now. It's like, here's, here's my cookbook. You can, yeah. you can look at all my recipes. That doesn't mean you're going to cook it as well as I can, mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, I think there's a lot of intangibles that kind of go into coaching. So, like, looking at an athlete, being able to read their face, if they have another interval in them or if they don't. That's something that I feel is like a gift that I have, you know? Knowing if the paces that you gave the kids were off. Knowing if you're looking at your stopwatch, if you know what, the rest I gave them was a little bit too much, so let me get them back on the line and, and lie to them about how much rest time they have. Or vice versa, where it's like the rest time isn't enough, and so then you have to, like, give them a little bit more. 
Um, so little things like that we have to modify workouts because of whatever factors it may be. We're a little bit too tired, it's a little bit too hot or humid. Um, so those are some of the things that I think help me become a better coach. I'll show you my workouts, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to run it the same way that I run it. Um, but in many ways, I'm not as traditional as a lot of other coaches. Um, my, you know, the guys that kind of mentored me through were like real big on doing like track work even during cross country season because pacing was critical. So I've always been big on, hey, let's go to the track and run 12400, 16400s, 2400s. That's something I've noticed now that um, during, after, once I graduated from Ferguson and once we, I, our relationship stopped itself um, uh, during cross country, I never touched the track again. Right. So like, I, I was kind of surprised going into that because I was like, oh, I, I, this is normal to me. Like, I, I didn't think this was like how you actually did it. Little did I know that you were one of the few people that actually do that. Right. Because then I look at now Danny how some of his work he does, like he, he's not on the track either for during cross season. And, and like that's something that I'm like, uh, but yeah, it's, 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 it's cool to see like the differences. Right. So another coach that, uh, that I really looked up to and uh, he passed away a couple years ago, Jeff Sommer over at Estero. He was one of the, the few guys that I know was, had no problem being on the track even during cross country season. For me, again, I think a lot of kids don't have a running background. So for me, I want to try to teach them some of the essentials. So something like learning how to run a particular pace, I think is critical. So the earlier I can teach that to a kid, I think the better. So rather than most programs are going to do like cruise miles, right? So today's workout is three by one mile and you're running like a cruise mile and then you work towards getting at a faster pace. I'd rather see you run at race pace and know what a race pace feels like. And then let's just have, you know, 12 intervals where you have a lot of rest in between. And as the season progresses, then we start opening it up. Oh, 600s, 800s, kilometers, and so forth. So it's, it's coming from a different direction from a lot of other coaches. But as long as they all get to where they need to be at the end, you know, and I just think it helps my kids transfer into track a little bit better also. I think I've had kids that kind of outperform uh, in track compared to maybe what some of the cross country times might be. Um, so from that side, again, it's a little bit different, but as long as my kids are learning something, you know, I think it's kind of moving in the right direction. Another reason why I've always been big on quarters is when you're coaching like boys varsity guys that are running low 16s and you're coaching girls, JV girls that are trying to break 30 minutes, Listen, I ain't doing no cruise intervals. There's no way we're going to pay attention to everybody at the same time when I got no assistant coaches. So I'll put 100 kids on the track, and you can modify that workout a gazillion ways. So it's like, all right, guys varsity, 20 by 400. You know, guys JV, 16 by 400. Girls varsity, 16 by 400. Girls JV, 12 by 400. Developmental kids, 8 by 400. You know, and so everybody's on the track at the same time, but some of them are doing like, you know, two on, one off, three on, one off. Some of them are doing, you know, uh, slower paces than other kids. So everybody kind of knows what they're supposed to be doing and they're all running different workouts, but at the same time on the track, all kind of running the same workout, you know, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always been pretty easy for me in that regard. Well, you said earlier that you coached like over 100 runners, girls and boys, correct? That yes. Person. How was it possible that you can like, you know, focus <laughs> on like almost every kid, I guess? Or did you kind of like steer obviously towards like the better guys or, you know what I'm trying to say? And, and let me break into this because uh, Raposo, during my time at Ferguson, knew, even if he had 100 kids, he knew every single kid's name, their last name, their grade, their PRs, their events, and everything, which is outrageous because one man can only know so much, but apparently not with Raposo. I'm going to quote Jose Garcia, who's <laughs> one of the coaches at Belen now, and um, he's one of the assistant coaches with me at St. Thomas. He goes, I'm not Ryan Raposo. I can't remember a hundred kids' names. They get all their spits all at once. Um, uh, I, 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 every time he says that, I think it's hilarious. I, for whatever reason, have one of these abilities where like numbers get stuck in my head. So for me, as long as I know the kid's name, which you know I learned within a couple of days, the rest all kind of falls into place. Mm -hmm. I literally know every kid's name. They're great, like like uh, David said. I know all their stats. I can not only tell you like their PR. I can tell you their PRs like by each year, I can tell you where they were on the track, where they were on the cross, where they've done the workouts. The numbers just kind of get stuck in my head because I sit there and I look at them, you know, so many times. Um, so for me, coaching 100 kids on the track at once, no big deal. If you see me during a track workout where I literally have short sprints, long sprints, middle distance, distance, hurdle, hurdle, I'm literally out there and I'll have a stopwatch in each hand and I'll have my wristwatch. And I'll be like, doo -doo, and I'll be blowing my whistle. Brrr. You know, if you ever see me at Tropical Park now, I'm out there with the whistle and I'm kind of directing multiple groups at once. Same thing, 100 kids. You know, no big deal because for me, it's you have to coach the kids to, to know what it is that you expect of them, you know. And I've always kind of structured workouts where everybody can kind of be on the track at the same time, everybody can kind of see what everybody else is doing. And so, when you have a lot of new young kids that are coming on up, if you have a kid that's been a, there's a junior or senior, they've been with you for two or three or four years, they already know what's up and they're going to tell them and get the young ones in shape. Hey, no, you got to do this, you got to do that. And they can kind of follow along. So, um, I actually find that most of my time spent 
throughout the majority of the season is actually spent with the, the slower kids, the developmental kids, because the older kids kind of know what they're doing. So they're like, all right, old kids, go on a seven mile run. All right, new kids, let's all go on an easy four, you know, whatever it might be. And then as we start, you know, as their season starts winding down, the JV kids gonna spend a lot more time with the varsity like in the second half of the season. Um, but I mean, if you talk to any of my athletes over the years, I don't care how good they were, they'll tell you that I give a crap about every kid all the way down to the slowest one. And I think one of the big reasons is because I was that kid. I was like a really, really slow kid when I was in high school, you know, and, and my coaches, they, they cared about me. And so I think they, they kind of understood that it's, you know, the kid that's working the hardest is the kid that, you know, you want to, you know, give the credit to, you know, because you might have these kids that are very, very talented, but they're slackers. You know, you talk to any coach, they don't want that kid. You know, they'd rather have a kid that's a hard worker. Um, and so that's kind of always been some of my philosophy. The dedication has been you know, a real important thing for me. You know, if that kid's busting their butt, I don't care how uh, slow they are. You know, they're, they're kind of working, they're going through, and that's the kid I want to work with. Mm -hmm. Something that I picked up from you, I think over time, with, uh, while you were coaching me, is the number aspect and like learning people's names and PRs. Because I see myself now, like every once in a while, like I'll find myself like thinking, oh, I'm, I'm not, I always remember this, these people's PRs and these people's numbers. Like, I, I'm literally <laughs> like, I don't even coach or anything like that, and I know all of Danny's runners' PRs and all their names and everyone and all of them, and then I can still go back to Ferguson and tell you all their PRs and all the kids. And so I think that's something that I picked up from you, just, just okay. from being well, here. Well, I saw you guys run at the, the UM track meet earlier in the year, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm sitting there with a the clipboard, and I'm getting all my St. Thomas guys split. I'm getting your guys split at the same time. I'm literally getting splits for like six guys all at once every every quarter lap, you know, or actually every every lap, every every quarter mile. You know, it's just like, that's that's how I am. We're just gonna sit there and be like, oh, no, this guy slowed down this lap. Oh, no, hey, this guy picked it up. Oh, look, here's a surge. And so that's just how I am. I'm just real big on numbers. You know, they kind of stick to me. And again, I think it's part of a critical component of coaching. I know a lot of coaches don't do that, but for me, I love that. Have you ever seen any of my split sheets?